Thank you, Judge. And uh, I want to thank Wes for the invitation to speak here. Um, David Wallace, who you can't see who's off stage, has been a great collaborator uh, with the NADCP and the NTSB. Uh, but I do have to tell you guys, you don't know how hard it is to be in Nashville at Opryland, like wearing a suit and tie. Somebody should at least say, bring your boots. What I'm going to do is actually give you a larger context. You are in the trenches every single day dealing with individuals. And I'm going to bring the issue of substance impaired driving to a larger context. And I'm going to do that um, by raising two points. One is acknowledging the NTSB's interest in this area, and then specifically talking about how the DWI and drug courts are critical and have a role in helping us reach zero, um, which is reaching zero crashes, people's lives lost, and injuries. Let me give you just a moment. You know what's interesting? I'm almost at the board two years now, and it's fascinating how everybody knows NTSB. Nobody has any idea what we actually do for a moment. Let me just give you a little info. This agency was created in 1967. It touches every one of your lives every single day. Uh, our mission is very straightforward. It's these two things. Basically, to investigate and determine the probable cause of major accidents, and then make recommendations so they don't happen again. We investigate accidents in all modes of transportation. You're used to seeing this scene. There's a major aviation crash, and you see those folks in blue jackets or shirts with the yellow letters on their back. But we actually investigate accidents in all modes of transportation, including pipeline, which is why I put this in. This is the San Bruno gas pipeline explosion. Eight people lost their lives, 38 homes destroyed. And I bring this up as an example of how the NTSB touches your life. This accident was actually about the aging infrastructure in the United States. And I hope all of you go home and wonder what pipelines are actually underneath your houses and your offices. Um, and I bring this up again because we look at all modes of transportation, including highway. And since 1967, we've done over 132,000 acts investigations, made over 13,500 safety recommendations, and those recommendations have actually gone to 2,500 different organizations. We have no regulatory or enforcement power, and so when you see that 82% acceptance rate that people have acted in an acceptable manner on recommendations, that's pretty good for us. Now. <clears throat> The reason I bring this in is because very often the NTSB is in the role of really being the moral conscious and compass for the transportation industry. We will often be highlighting issues that take 20 years before action actually, we, act, we see some kind of action take place. Uh, and so I bring that up because I think this is an area that actually has had a lot of attention, but it needs renewed interest. So I put this slide up because this is what we do. Uh, basically, there are hazards out there. Jim Reason came up with a Swiss cheese model uh, of why accidents happen. There are hazards out there. There are all kinds of defenses and barriers and things that keep us safe. But when the holes in that Swiss cheese line up, we have an accident. And that's when the NTSB gets involved at the pointy end. And one of those accidents that we investigated last month, 24 years ago, was the deadliest accident that involved an impaired, alcohol-impaired driver in the United States. That was May 14, 1988, the Carrollton, Kentucky accident where an individual in a pickup truck going the wrong way hit a school bus that was being used by a church group. And as you see, 27 people lost their lives. 24 of those were kids, three adults, many injuries. As you see on the slide, the driver, a 0.28 blood alcohol level. This is the deadliest crash in the history of the United States that involved an impaired driver. And since 1988, 300,000 other people have lost their lives to substance impaired drivers. And since 1988, millions of people have been injured. And of course, it's not just those lives lost or injured, but their family and friends, in an instant, had their lives changed forever as well. This is really an important point for all of us. In 1988, 18,611 people lost their lives in substance-impaired driving accidents. That number in 2010 is now reduced to 10,228. What is significant about this is while we've gone from 41% of highway fatalities being related to substance impaired driving, it's at 31%. And as you see in the last bullet there, that one third of all highway fatalities has stayed the same for over a decade. For 15 years, basically, 31% of deaths on the roadways are related to substance impaired drivers. And just to put this in context, if you take all of the fatalities in all other modes of transportation and multiply them times four, you still do not hit the 10,228 lives that have been lost to substance impaired drivers. And what you see at the bottom there is that every single day now, more people's lives are lost to alcohol impaired drivers than that one deadliest crash where 27 people lost their lives 20, 
four years ago. <clears throat> this is often unrecognized, but I want to acknowledge since 1988, 200 police officers have also lost their lives to substance impaired drivers. And I always like to acknowledge the fact that they are on the front line. The reason you see people in your courts and in your system is because police officers are out there identifying and bringing them into your courts. The NTSB has the most wanted list since 2003, alcohol impaired drivers, and this issue has been on our list. Um, this is our top 10 list, and over the years, we have actually made 120 alcohol impaired driver related safety recommendations. However, our last one was a decade ago. This is it, a comprehensive program. There were 11 elements in that program, hard to keep track actually, and what you see at the bottom there, there was a focus on a particular group. This recommendation was over 10 years old, and that was part of the reason we held a forum last month called Reaching Zero, Actions to Eliminate Substance Impaired Driving. And I have two slides, I'm not gonna read or talk to you about these. 37 panelists, eight panels, a whole range of topics such as these. And I think what's important is that what was very clear is that there is no single solution that is gonna solve this problem that will help us reach zero. There are a variety of approaches that are needed, and that's why what I wanna do is highlight three that are connected to DWI and drug courts that were highlighted at the forum. So, Judge, he doesn't know this, but <laughs> I'm actually using him as one of them. Um, I think in this one, you're gonna read it, but I, I think what the judge did in this particular statement was identify a focus with DWI and drug courts on changing behavior rather than just processing cases. A second issue that came up that really showed the unique role for DWI and drug courts had to do with identifying offenders' particular risks and their needs and also the supervision and accountability, which is part of the, the theme that's up here. And the third one I wanted to highlight is actually from somebody at our safety recommendations office, and she pointed out really how you take the system's comprehensive approach, but tailor it to individuals. Individual needs and specific tools among all the available tools to figure out what's gonna be best and appropriate for that offender. So I just wanted to highlight those three from the forum and give you this as a summary slide. One of the things I think that is your greatest strength is you have data. It's clear that DWI and drug courts are effective based on evidence. You've collected information, more data are coming, and I think that's critical for people to know how effective your work really is at your endpoint, those people whose lives are changed. You use what I call a tailored systems approach. That comprehensive approach, it's not cookie cutter. You take a comprehensive approach, but then you individualize it so each individual is looked at for their particular needs, the tools needed to help them make a difference. The other thing that's been fascinating learning about your uh, meeting this week is it's not just about education. You're here innovating and evolving. And I think that's critical for continued growth. The other bullet on there, scaling, you know that's an issue. Um, you have such an effective approach here. We really need to see a way how to get this resource available to everyone in the country. The last line there, I hope all of you appreciate this is a big, big deal and that DWI and drug courts play a critical role in helping our entire country reach zero. No more crashes, deaths, or injuries from a substance impaired driver. And I wanna finish with this. Um, this is from One for the Road. Farron Lerner used this quote from Dr. Ralph Hudson, uh, and I'm just gonna read this. This national embarrassment and disgrace has not been just the accumulation of death and injury, but rather the strange acceptance of death and injury as the way of life. So what's interesting is we have a major aviation accident, several hundred people lose their lives, it's tragic. But in 2010, 10,228 people lost their lives, millions were injured. And probably the biggest challenge all of us have is that complacency is too common. We have to make it unacceptable. Unacceptable that any life is lost in a crash due to a substance impaired driver. And I'm gonna finish by just saying I think it's great when your graduates and families have a chance to thank you. But on behalf of the NTSB, I'm also gonna thank you because you have a critical role in helping us reach zero. And all of you are very, very important to all of us to be able to help address this very significant issue and really make a difference. Thank you very much.